Uh, normally, jockeys, we rose at between 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning and headed out to the racetrack for our morning workouts. And morning workouts really are comprised of visiting barns that you would ride for trainers in the future, maybe that day. You'd be visiting the mounts, the horses if, that you're going to ride in the next day, two, maybe in the next week or two. The, the training hours are typically from 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning until about 10 a.m. in the morning. By 11 o'clock in the morning, I would make my way back to the track, track itself and head to the jockey's room. The very first thing that I do when I hit the jockey's quarters is weigh myself. Come on in, we'll do this. Uh, if, it was a, if it was a fruitful night with food the night before, uh, a lot of liquids, it could be pretty tight and I'm expecting bad news when I step on that scale. So this would be to put a smile on my face or a frown on my face. Nobody in the jockey's room during racing hours except the jockeys and their employees. My day was pretty much go in here and get in the, get in the shower, shower off, go in the steam room for about 25 to 30 minutes. I would, I would do a little calisthenics, I would stretch, I would shave, I would just loosen up basically if you will. And I would lose a pound, a pound and a half in there doing that. This is the masseur's room. An another uh, pretty good place for a jockey to cool down, regroup. I might come in here and lay down with a towel over me for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I told you I might take a, a little brief nap. It would probably happen here. There's a lot of moving parts in the jock's room. Um, there's a lot of equipment. I mean, we call it our corner as jockeys. We each have an individual locker, and we have one valet that takes care of us from one to as many as five jockeys at one particular time. So this was my corner when I was riding. I call it my corner. I shared it with several other jockeys. And if, uh, the equipment, the actual saddles, are, are located down below. And, and I'll pull out one saddle here. This is a particularly big saddle. Uh, let me get a smaller saddle. This saddle would weigh about, oh, probably about three and a half or four pounds. This saddle would weigh about a pound and a half. You can see the difference. And you would use this saddle on horses that are weighted with higher weights, unless you're very heavy that day. And this saddle would obviously be used for horses with lesser weights. But before the silks go on for each particular race, we'll put on our, our safety vest. It's called a flak jacket, if you will. Uh, it's to minimize uh, injuries if, if and when we fall. And it's not a question of if you're going to fall, it's when in, in, uh, in this business. It's the only business I know that the ambulance follows you. So yeah, it's a risky business. Uh, and that's kind of the, the bad side of it. You've seen the, the weight losing, early mornings, possibility of injury. But there's a lot of good side too. There's a lot of thrill and personal satisfaction from winning. And part of the winning is preparation. And this is where the preparation starts. Not only exercising the horses in the morning that you might ride in the future, but reading the daily racing form. The Wall Street Journal, if you will, for jockeys. It, it's unique in Saratoga that they walk through the crowd. And it's, it's, it's for a reason. We love to interact with the fans here at Saratoga. They're really nice. And all the kids, even adults, love the autographs. So, so as we, as a jockey, enters the paddock in the walking room unit, the horse will already have been saddled and he goes now to meet the owner and her trainer and kind of get last minute's instructions. Horses are saddled and the saddling enclosure is over there. That saddle is actually put on, tightened up, ready to go and each individual tree has a number on it so if I'm riding number 11 I've got to go over to that tree over there with number 11 on it and that's where my horse will stop. So I'll go over and I'll get on him. So once the jockey's mounted, he's off to the track. We'll warm up the horse for about four or five minutes, give me a chance to feel the horse out if I've never ridden him before. Gives me a chance to feel how he moves, uh, but mostly it's just for the horse to limber up before the race. The race is off. Hopefully we win. The team that was just here discussing instructions will be, have big smiles on their face and will be happy, and we'll all make a lot of money. When riding the Kentucky Derby as a jockey, several items of equipment are required. Among them a helmet for safety and goggles for vision. And because we run on dirt in the Kentucky Derby, you get dirty. And that requires goggles. Now going a mile and a quarter, it requires more than one pair. I've used as many as six pairs. In 1993 and 1996, that's exactly how many pairs of goggles I used riding Grindstone and Sea Hero. Now this is a beautiful sunny day. 
But kid you not, we still need multiple pair because they put the water on the track themselves, creating a lot better traction for the horses as they go over it. But six pair of goggles? Try putting six pair of sunglasses on top of each other and looking through them. Things get a little fuzzy, a little blurry. It distorts your vision somewhat, especially peripherally. You can see very little from side to side. As we go through the running of the race and are in amongst the pack, the dirt comes back flying, covers the top pair of our goggles, so we must reach up while we're riding with two fingers and pull a pair of goggles down. We repeat that as we go through the track one by one, hoping not to cover my mouth. That has happened before, and that's a heck of a problem getting my air. I'm here to win a race, and I have to make multiple decisions and try and coax the best run out of my horse that I can. But I need to see very clearly. And through all this, I have to reach up unconsciously and pull them down. And I hope that I've judged the amount of goggles I've carried with the amount of distance I've traveled and not run out before I hit the finish line. It's happened to me before, and it's not fun. This, this is a dangerous profession, uh, without a doubt, and we know that when we take our license out. And we accept it, and it's part of the game. We just hope that, that what we go through is not the, the, the ending one, the, the tough one, the one that keeps you out the rest of your life. Jerry takes us inside racing with us right now. To me, there's nothing more exciting than riding horse races for a living. But with that excitement comes an element of danger. How dangerous? Well, how many jobs do you know where an ambulance actually follows you? For every race run here at Pimlico today, the ambulance will follow the field of horses as they travel around the track. Even the ride to the track is not without risk. Horses can spook at almost anything, throwing their rider at any moment. And along with all the physical demands, the jockey must survive the mental challenge of the spill. Jockeys must accept the fact that it's not if they will fall, but when. Yes, bones will be broken, but you just have to pray it's not career ending. Sweetwater Oak on the outside of Current Lady Head and Head. Sweetwater Oak loses the rider. Current Lady in front. Almost always, spills happen without warning. Fortunately for jockey Julian Lepereau, he landed on a safety rail, which has a hard plastic shield on top of it, allowing a jockey to bounce clear rather than being wrapped around one of its supporting poles. Lepereau was lucky and walked away from this, but not all jockeys do. Unlike NASCAR drivers who are surrounded by a steel cage to protect them during a crash, a jockey's only safety equipment are their helmet, and their protected cage, the vest. There's really not much to this. Another example is Eclipse Award-winning jockey John Velasquez, who's been visibly absent from this year's Triple Crown races due to an injury sustained in this spill in April. This looks bad, but he was actually lucky that he'll only miss three to five months with a broken shoulder. Unlike other athletes, jockeys don't have guaranteed contracts. So if we don't ride, we don't get paid. So just like I did, and just like Johnny Velasquez will do, we heal, rehab, and put the spill out of our mind. Because jockeys, of all people know, you've got to get back on the horse. We are a different type of breed. We knew going in how dangerous it was. Not if, but when you fall. Injuries for a jockey is inevitable. It's going to happen. We're all going to get hurt at some point. It's how bad you're going to get hurt. A little bit crazy. You have a 1,200 pound horse. A bit brave. And you weigh 110 pounds. <laughs> and a bit courageous at the same time. It really doesn't bother me that I've broken my neck three times. Oh, I crushed my skull at church and I was. I have a plate and five screws holding my collarbone together. Broken pelvis. Broken ribs. Collapsed lung. Four, five pins put in my hand. My head looked like a spider web. I fractured it so bad. Took out my spleen. Broken my kneecap. I broken my fingers. Unfortunately, it's part of the game. And because it's part of the game, we have to make sure that we're thoroughly protected when we're out there. But uh, there's only so much you can do, you know, besides putting row bars on horses or something, you know. But, uh, I mean, it's it's... You have a helmet, you have a flak jacket now, and your boots, and that's pretty much it. When I'm scared out there, my saddle's going on the wall. I don't have time for that. The day I'm going to start thinking about it, that's the day I'm going to retire. To get back on a horse, to me, is what I love to do. I go out there, do what I have to do, and that's my job. 
because I love to do it. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't uh, it doesn't scare me one bit. Uh, I don't look at the severe the consequences of of being that uh, it might um, shorten my career. It, it, it all comes down to what you want to do in life. And this is what I want to do in, in the, for the rest of my life, as long as I can. Uh, we worry about horses every day from the, about 5 a.m. in the morning till in the evening and you know my typical routine will start at about five i get a call from night watchmen at each division i keep a division here at keeneland i've got a farm on the north side of town called magdalena that we get uh, we have uh, room for 63 there um, i've got a division of horses at churchill downs where we have 36 so a uh, typical day starts out with a call from the night night man to let me know how everybody ate and then from there, I'll hear from the assistant trainers or my farm assistant, and we'll go over a day's routine, and there's a, a lot of detail, detail, detail. Um, which horses are training, which horses are going to be broken, which mares are going to be out, who's going to be bred to whom that year, um, you know, where's the, which horse is going to race, which jockey's going to ride, what's the veterinarian going to do before the horse runs, uh, do we need to check a horse after works? I mean, the details are forever. Race day is different. Um, they have to race, so you have to be careful. The, the caretaker will come in at 4.30 in the morning. We'll get, prepare them for the race. The rider will take them out maybe for a little jog. Not anything real serious because he is racing, just to loosen him up. These cameras wouldn't be here race day. So it's a little different. Uh, he has to be left alone. He's going to race with his buddies. There's seven, eight of horses in the race, and you know, no one's rooting for him, put it that way. So it's, it's the way we do it, and it is a little different race day. So I've been doing this since I'm a teenager. I've basically been doing this since I'm 18 years old. That's it. So that's a long way. You know, I got gray hair now. I used to have black hair. So, you know, I've been doing this a while, but that's it. The one thing that I love about this business, and uh, I tell everybody, no one has a lock on it. There's no exact science in it, there's no lock, and I think that's what makes it the great equalizer. And that's what I love about the business. But you still have to be lucky because it's just not, a, it's not, a, it's not an exact science. It's a feel and, and you hope that your, your turn comes up and you're blessed. And we've been blessed. And then after the race, naturally, you hopefully that uh, you lead him from the winner's circle. But uh, we bring him back to the barn. Uh, obviously, he gets his bath again because he just raced. We cool him out 45 minutes to an hour, make sure he's all cooled out from the race. Made a little grass or just a little alfalfa, whatever he, he got from, you know. Uh, and then we'll feed him probably a couple hours after he races because you want him not to to be too excited after a race, so horses' uh, stomachs are different than human beings, and you know, uh, you have to be very careful with that too. So, and then again, uh, give him a nice hot meal, and then he'll go to sleep, and uh, my night watchman will watch him, that everything is okay, that the effects of the race weren't too bad, and we'll greet him next month. start of every race, the assistant starters will close the front doors, which are really heavy, and they're spring-loaded, held together by this electrically charged magnet. Now the horse and jockey are loaded, and the official starter is ready to not turn on the electricity, but to turn it off, allowing the lever to drop and the gates to open. simple? Well, if everything goes smoothly, it is. But that's not always the case. As a jockey, I felt the starting gate was one of the most dangerous aspects of racing. No. 
Why is it so dangerous? Well, for one thing, you're surrounded by steel. Now, this gate might look open and airy. Most horses, who can be a bit claustrophobic anyway, feel the crampness of these close quarters. When we enter the gate, the horses usually appear to be very calm on the outside. But on the inside, well, their charged up engine is ready to explode. And the trick is to time that explosion to happen exactly when the doors open. I'm Tom Durkin, I'm the track announcer here at Aqueduct and also at uh, Belmont Park and at uh, Saratoga. And they're off. Uh, if you're a builder, you make houses out of bricks. If you're a race caller, you make race calls out of words. Uh, this is the book where I keep my words. I did a word count and there's about uh, 1,600 in here. And it's all sorts of different categories. This, these are words that you can use to describe fast sprints. Runaway, frenzied, scalding, absurdly fast, frantic, vigorous, gut wrenching, a circuit of speed, and that just means that there's just a lot of speed. Well, takes the field through the opening quarter mile and zips a 23 and 1 opening quarter mile, pressed on the outside now by its princess. Then its royal vessel sitting just outside the lead. I try to keep it very simple. My job is to accurately and appropriately describe the races. Moving four or five wide as they approach the top of the stretch. And then it's Bella Blue down toward the inside decorated court. Only two and a half lengths from the lead. Turns for home. Maggie's Miracle, Ed's Princess, and Navidad the three of them. Head to head as they come into the final furlong here. And it is Navadano in front. Really important to keep your eye on the horses all the time. Um, that's obvious. Sometimes, though, those names just don't come up, particularly later in the day. Uh, I find in my dotage, uh, <laughs> those names don't come quite as quickly. But uh, this is uh, a bit of a uh, security blanket for me. Decorated Cordon with a fighting chance. Royal Vessel there on the far side. And Princess is back to fourth. Here's Decorated Court, who comes on to take the lead as they come down to the wire. Decorated Court, the winner by a length of the half. Stable mates very close for the runner-up spot there. Navadano and Royal Vessel and Bella Blue is third. Crowd starts to roar. We're ready for a start in the run for the roses. Talk as money was acting up just a bit in the starting gate. And they're off in the Kentucky Derby. And Song and a Prayer comes out in stride from his inside post. Balto Star is there, not far behind Millennium Wind. And here comes Keats from the far outside. Bias for the first time. And it is Song and a Prayer to lead the way. Balto Star right there with him. Keats on the outside is running along in third. Millennium Wind behind them fourth. Hungary is fifth. At point given is on the outside, heading for the clubhouse turn. He's racing in sixth position now. And then it's Talk is Money seventh in between horses. Express Tour is a close to the pay pace. He's only about six lengths from the lead. Then it's a break of five lengths now. Invisible Ink is ninth on the outside. Star Tech is running in tenth. AP Valentine is 11th. Thunder Blitz lumbering along in 12th place. Then it's a break of another three. Back to Monarcos. Dollar Bill followed on the inside by Arctic Boy. A break of six to stretch running long shots. 50 stars in Jamaican Rum. They're 20 lengths from the lead. The opening half mile was the fastest in Derby history. 44 and 4 fifth seconds. Song and a Prayer's pace is blistering down the back stretch. With four and a half furlongs remaining, it's Song and a Prayer, and he leads by two lengths over Balto Star. Millennium Wind is now third toward the inside. Congaree in good striking position on the outside. And the pent up power of Point Given. Five lengths from the lead, he's beginning to advance. Express Tour is right with him as the field rounds the far turn. Then Invisible Ink, Thunder Blitz as well within striking range. Jorge Chavez gets busy on Monarcos, and they're surging as they move toward the top of the stretch. And Congaree has come away with the lead. Here comes his stablemate, Point Given, on the outside. They're in three quarters in 109 and one. Record time here in the Derby You're at the top of the stretch, and it is Congaree who is full up. Here comes Monarcos under a heavy drive on the far outside. Invisible Ink is there. Point 
given, not today. One furlong left. Here comes Monacos, who sweeps to the lead. He's pulling away by two. He's pulling away by three. Jorge Chavez and Monacos have won the Kentucky Derby. And the final time was one minute, 59 and four fifth seconds. He was as fast as Secretariat. And it was a photo for second there. Invisible ink in Calgary as well. Absolutely thrilling. Jorge Chavez on top of the world. Jorge Chavez on top of the Kentucky Derby winner. Now let's ride with Jorge Chavez and Monarcos the entire way in the Kentucky Derby. Sort of breaking a little sideways. Not uncommon and uh, no real problems. Number 16 in the gold and blue colors of the Oxleys. And getting away cleanly as Chavez places the stretch running Colt in the proper position. Going along easily as you see and uh, really clear by himself there as they go by the finish line the first time and into the turn. Dollar Bill just behind him to the outside but Monarcos clear sailing at this point as Chavez has yet to ask him for any run and moving up on his inside Arctic boy goes up to go head and head with Monarcos who doesn't seem to be bothered by it tends to his business in a relaxed mode. Now about midway down the back stretch where Monarcos made that giant move to win the Florida Derby is where Chavez starts to pump and changes his goggles right there. Gets his whip out and now he is beginning to ride in earnest. Gives Monarcos a little tap to wake him up. And look at him accelerate as he moves inside two horses. Inside again on the rail. The ground saving trip from Chavez. And he has Monarcos in full gear right here. Monarcos picking up horses right and left. He goes by Keats, who's fading. And next he has dead aim on number four, Thunder Blitz. And in front of him, Balto Star as the speed horses are dropping back. And Monarcos gets a tap again from Chavez, who puts him on the outside, out in the middle of the track to keep him out of trouble. Here's Point Given looming now just to his inside. Chavez comes over right there is where the objection occurred. But you can see that Invisible Ink really was not impeded as Monarcos was clear as he went by. Chavez having switched the whip to his left hand now drives to the finish line. They call him Chop Chop because of his whip work. He doesn't need it here though. Monarcos home free in the Derby. Woo, baby! <laughs>